idea of having this last panel devoted to equal liberty came from a discussion that arose during that seminar. I don't know why it came up, but I remember that we had this discussion about uh, liberty, uh, equality. It was uh, started by Akil, and uh, uh, we discussed it with our uh, graduate uh, students taking that seminar. So this is the starting point. When we had the idea of having this uh, 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 this uh, conference, I thought that the three of us, plus my very good friend uh, Larry Kritzman, uh, uh, would reflect on that notion of equality. One of the main aspects of the 1789 French Revolution, it has been said yesterday, was the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It was obviously very important. Two France uh, uh, praises herself uh, with two different titles. One is to be La Fille de uh, um, the The other one is to be La Patrie des Droits de l'Homme, the eldest child, daughter of the church and the land of uh, the rights of the man. I'm not sure that she would be claiming any more. The first one, the Edith of English, laïcité has been uh, uh, very strong in that country, as we know. But Patrick Edouard Lhomme is a question that is interesting to raise. And indeed, that declaration, the first article of that declaration reads, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Uh, uh, social distinctions may be founded only <coughs> on the general good. Let me bracket out all important elements such as uh, um, uh, in rights or social distinctions or general good, very important, but keep just the two notions free on the one hand, equal on the other hand, liberty and equality. Gabriel Rockhill posed yesterday the question, do those who make declarations mean what they say? Hmm. Uh, uh, it can be said that indeed, only if you make a sharp distinction between the land of civility that France is and the land of violence that it took the rest of the world to be, where barbarism reigns and therefore France is allowed on those lands to offer a face different from that of the land of the human rights, if you make that distinction, then yes, they would mean what they say. It is just circumscribed in the land of civility, and France could have forced laborers in her colonies, etc. It doesn't count because those are the land of barriers. So people from those lands, precisely, do know, do know that words do not mean what is being declared. One question, though, could be posed. Maybe you could say that, nevertheless, those words inspired people outside of France, taught them, even if they were under French uh, domination or slavery, taught them liberty and equality. <coughs> well, if you raise the question that way, Toussaint Louverture never ignored that he was born free. Actually, he was a prince, the uh, prince of the town. He remained also so, even in bondage. And he never ignored that he was equal to any other human being. So he did not need to be taught that by the first article of the French Declaration of the uh, Rights of Man and Citizen. So in a way, he was doing the teaching. The teaching was coming from him, his revolt. The revolution he led at Saint-Domingue meant this. Let me teach you what the words you declared actually mean. And you could say that anti-colonial struggles also had that pedagogical dimension saying you did declare these words, you do not incarnate them. Because declaring and be the incarnation of are two radically different things. But let me teach you what it is that the words you declared uh, 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 meant. I am and sent off to take uh, uh, an author who reflected on that dichotomy on that double face of the land of the uh, human rights on the one hand 
and the colonial power who had no trouble installing uh, uh, forced labor for so many decades in the colonies, even after slavery, used to make a distinction between what he called uh, uh, conjunctural France. The conjunctural France would be the France who would be betraying uh, uh, the, the very words that she had declared, and what he called the structural France. For him, the true France, precisely the France that declared those uh, 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 rights of man and uh, citizen. That structural France could correspond roughly to what Jean Ferrat thinks as la France. As you know, elle répond toujours du long de la Vespierre, as uh, Jean Ferrat has uh, uh, famously uh, sung. So, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that precisely meaning of declarations cannot be circumscribed. But it means that once they are the object of the declaration, they start an open-ended process of unfolding meaning and new effects even in spite of the people who declare them. They become something of a movement. They create a movement, an open-ended process, and this is how H.L. Bolivar invites us to think of that association in the very first article between equality on the one hand and liberty on the other hand. Liberal thinking wants to co completely disconnect the two. They would think that equality is on the side of the collective. If I'm calling for equality, I'm calling for the collective to basically flatten everything out and equalize what is not equal uh, naturally or for other uh, uh, reasons. And they think that equality is the contrary of freedom, at least of individual freedom, since the individual is the seat or should be the seat of rights. Equal liberty, the concept coined by H.L. Uh, uh, Valibar, is precisely this idea that even if the two are different, there is such a thing as some kind of Kantian synthesis that is possible. They are not equal, which means that equal liberty is not saying there is an equation here, but that there is an open-ended process of their equalization. And that is the definition of the movement of emancipation. And this is why something that was declared in a very particular locality, that small town of Europe called Paris, by people who were dealing with their own affairs uh, uh, by making this declaration, sort of came like the devil out of the box and came to mean something that would go around the world and maybe come back to haunt them and to haunt uh, the very country which uh, called herself the land of human rights and thought that she was bringing emancipation to the rest of the world. It was actually the rest of the world which was going to teach her that the words she declared without thinking or without even meaning what they say actually had this emancipatory uh, charge and the capacity, the universal capacity to make these radically heterogeneous concepts, equality and liberty, come together in equality. I want to talk about something that's on the other side of the Atlantic in relation to the question of equilibrium. Uh, and that's Ferguson, Ferguson, Missouri, and the horrifying, uh, horrifying events that took place there, uh, which was just another iteration of previous events, and unfortunately, it did have a future, just listening to the news every day. Um, the time is, in fact, out of joint, and there's something really rotten in America. Uh, I want to just very briefly evoke certain topoi uh, from Etienne Bellibal's book, and then I want to talk very rapidly, uh, more specifically about Ferguson. And uh, the things where I see a, a convergence about this case of Ferguson and equilibrium is one, the 
antonomies of citizenship, particularly the idea of democratic power and rights within the framework of the nation state. Second, the institution of citizenship, which lies at the heart of contradictions that has multiple iterations in a democracy, particularly here in the United States. Three, that there is nothing natural between citizenship and democracy. And four, the incessant encounter between the logic of the quest for equality and the police logic, a police state logic, as we've seen in the survey, that disrupts the presuppositions of what we think constitutes uh, citizenship. And in this confrontation at Ferguson, we perceive the contours of insurrectional politics and the need for new modalities of citizenship or what we have called citizenship. And here, reading with, perhaps against a bit, Etienne Baribar, we've seen, once again, the aporia, not only between equality and liberty, but also between law and justice. What is most striking in the context of the recent killing of the African-American teenager, Robert Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, by police officer Darren Wilson this past summer is the way in which the law might possibly foreclose on the playing out of justice. Isn't the use of a weapon on an individual, the officer who did this, who has apparently surrendered an act of violence beyond the realms of justice and freedom? We find ourselves in a period of moral decay here. After the shooting of Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of George Zimmerman in Florida and the killing of another black teen because he played his music too loud, the Robert Brown killing has made us vividly aware that the so-called post-racial era declared by news commentators after the 2008 election was a little more than a fiction, a somewhat big Benetton-esque publicity uh, that said that democracy had in fact been realized. Just like President H.B.W. Bush's Bush the Pair, his claim of a new world order following the breakup of the Soviet Empire, television journalists now believe that history too had come to an end. Beyond the messianic belief in the singularity of American democracy, the American dream, which Obama himself used in the last um, State of the Union message, we need to exercise a duty regarding the heritage of democracy and become more vigilant in its increasingly level of regulation. What happened in Ferguson represents this, this, uh, this aporia that I've talked about, but on another level, an aporia between the calculable and the incalculable. To declare that the civil rights movement has enabled an African-American male to become president of the United States renders that hypothesis part of a promised concept that was calculable. It might even be described as that which was destined to be, once again taking up this idea of the American dream. Um, in the case of Obama's election, one might claim that it was pre-programmed, making the promise what has already been. But what happened in Ferguson, part of a chain of iterations involving white racism against young black males, requires a challenge to the ways in which we intermingle equality with freedom. Beyond that, one cannot analyze what happened in Ferguson 
without speaking of experience itself, which is that of the other, the invention of a so-called other. Of the 53 members of the Ferguson police force, only three were African American in a community whose majority were people of color, about 60%. Racial parity on the police force is just one aspect of the problem. The police chief and the mayor are white. Only one council member and one member of the Ferguson School Board are black. Shouldn't one have to worry about uh, the force of those whose ostensible occupation is in fact to protect the life of the citizens. The neo-colonial occupation of the black community, wartime force by white police officers at the very, is at the very least inhospitable. In a way, the police appropriate through different modalities of violence and expel those who rightly occupy a space whose home can never be won. The imaginary community represented through the injustice of police behavior enforces a law that is in fact not one. To be ethically responsible to the events of Ferguson requires that we be responsible to it without calculation and without rules. Accordingly, under these circumstances, the application of the law in the context of race relations in Ferguson can never occupy a moment when a decision can be made justly. The ghostliness of white racism is never fully present or absent from the events of Ferguson due to the insidious form that it has taken in what some unjustly characterize as post-racial America. To be sure, the problem of the inside and the outside are problematized here for they are neither separable nor yet always connected to one another, and I'll be done in a second. On the Friday following the shooting of Michael Brown, the State Highway Patrol, chosen by Missouri Governor Nixon, her overdetermined name to say the least, he was chosen to handle the case, the police department released a videotape. It showed an image of Brown stealing cigarettos from a convenience store while pushing its owner. The framing of the image on the same day that the highway patrol released the name of the officer who shot Brown was used to suggest that Officer Wilson, who still not been arrested, his shooting of the team resulted from his learning of the robbery. What we see here, at least initially, is not only attempt, an attempt and blatant manipulation, but also an unmitigated representation to enact the presence of the present, or what Derrida once called artifactuality. If we follow the logic of the initial reaction of the so-called CNN judicial experts related to the release of the tape, where Michael Brown is seen pushing the store owner after having stolen the cigarettes. The petty theft, according to the law, is now classified as a felony because of the young man's so-called use of force. A committed felony, according to the law, justifies the police use of force and therefore the justification of the shooting. The here or now suggests that acting lawfully, the initial conclusion meant to be drawn from the manipulative release of the videotape does not mean to act justly the use of force by Officer Wilson. What is forgotten here is that the six bullets that pierced a defenseless 18-year-old person of color whose apparent act of surrender was apparently ignored, but is yet another act that has already had multiple iterations in the United States and has continued to have them. The power of the gaze is equally important in what I believe is a miscarriage of justice. More often than not, the targeting of young black males 
has more to do with cultural practices, such as the way in which they dress. We saw this in the case of Trayvon Martin, and once again in that of Michael Brown. The perception of minority teenagers' vestimentary choices as part of a semiotic code identifies him as other, and therefore labels him a dangerous individual. And this ultimately deprives him of personhood and rights as well. The master, in this case the police, to keep, commits violence to keep the so-called outsider living inside out, out of his home and out of freedom by delimiting the place where he is safe to live. What we have learned from Ferguson is that by challenging the politics of the proper enables us to see that justice can and never should be arrested. It must be practiced in terms of an itinerary functioning in the name of an impossible idea. Can one discover paradoxically in the inhuman behavior of the officer an activity essential to the coming of democracy in the sense of the survival or perhaps even the possibility of living on. It's also a great pleasure to be part of this discussion because uh, my initial attraction to Marxism was uh, through introduction to Althusser. And uh, soon after that, we were reading, uh, reading Capital, but sitting in Calcutta. So I think it's a very interesting occasion for me to come back and uh, have this opportunity of discussing socialist theory with Etienne uh, Balibar. Now, I thought that uh, it, the book, uh, Equal Liberty, I think, is an immensely rich book. It's also a book which goes in many different directions. Uh, what I should do would be to focus on the essay, which is called Equal Liberty, because I think it's an exceptionally important uh, contribution to the task of reigniting, in a certain sense, uh, socialist theory today. One thing which I gradually persuaded myself about, which differs from Mathusa, is that Marxism is a deeply historicist form of thought. I genuinely believe now that Marxism is actually one of the most thoroughgoing forms of historicism. What I mean by that is that you know, Marxism uh, disallows the asking of philosophical questions outside of historical contextualization. And the other thing which I think is important uh, for our discussion today is that it's part of Marxism to believe, uh, I'll come to the reason why it's part of Marxism, it's part of Marxism to believe that history would always throw surprises at us. In fact, living in history is not to expect that you know, we would solve the riddle of history by getting certain sort of structural features of capitalism or structural features of modernity, but to understand that modernity, particularly its two different logics, the logic of capitalism, which defines it in one way, and the logic of the modern state, which I think it, it defines modernity in a different way. And in my own view, I think there is a slight deficiency in Marx in the sense that I think he accorded too much of sort of privacy to the understanding of the logic of capitalism. And he underrated, in a certain sense, the efficacy of the quite independent logic of the modern state, which I think is partly reflected in Balibar's own <coughs> reflection. But in any case, because of that, I think it's part of believing in Marxism to believe that Marxism has to be renewed. It, Marxism is not a theory where you can actually take shelter behind truths which are actually uh, one for all time by Marx or whoever in whatever generation. It, history will throw surprises at us. And we have to be agile, we have to be historically in our thinking and try to figure out what, what is it that has really changed and how we can deal with it. And I think this is something that Balibar's essay does wonderfully. That's why I think it's a great attempt to reignite serious debate about socialist theory. Now, the second point I want to make is that in Marx, <coughs> there are two views of uh, modernity or capitalism. All of you know that, so I don't have to go into the elaboration of that. One is a kind of structural view, 
that the other one is the view, which is immortally captured in Marx's phrase, uh, all that is solid melts into air. So I think we do not understand Marx's vision of the historical nature of modernity without understanding two or three things. That it produces structures which produce compulsions, but these structures also get transformed, not because of external pressures, not merely because of internal corruption in a certain sense, but also through something which I think is sometimes underestimated in Marx's discussions on Marx, uh, through the pressure of what I would call reflexive action. Because one of the major features of modernity, I think, is the capacity of human beings, particularly organized in large collectivity, to act upon themselves, groups acting upon themselves, states acting upon institutions like the capitalist firm or political <coughs> institutions acting upon themselves. So because of that, I think modernity produces a kind of logic of reflexive action, which does not let institutions and structures stay what they are. And it's because of that that I think we need to have a view of history, which is both structural and insistently historicist at the same time. <coughs> now, there are two or three things which I found particularly interesting in Bible, uh, since the essay is familiar to all of us, uh, I don't need to labor some of these points. I, let me first make a point about which I, I don't know whether to agree or disagree with them. I suspect I partly agree and partly disagree. Uh, I found his elaboration of the initial idea of equal liberty, the idea that uh, equal liberty is something which is actually implicit in the declaration of the human rights itself, in the ideals of the French Revolution. I found that both wonderful in a certain sense, but also troubling. I suspect because of my, uh, the historicism of my thinking about Marx. On the one side, I think what it does wonderfully is to show that there is a kind of philosophical idea which must resist you know, institutional translations which it went through in subsequent history in two directions. You know, either the liberal institution, the liberal translation, which says that liberty can be realized only with the sacrifice of equality, or that equality can be realized only with the sacrifice of freedom. So these are the two sort of historical translations of that idea. And he resists that, and he thinks that you know, the idea itself is something which, uh, which should be defended. And the idea itself that should resist this kind of segmented or partial uh, tra institutional translation of the idea. Now, I find that very compelling as a kind of philosophical, political elaboration of the idea. But uh, I would probably like to soften the historical thing a little bit and probably suggest that it would be wrong to say that all that idea is already present in the French Revolution. I can play on the phrase that Bashir quoted that whether people who make declarations don't understand the meaning of what they say, or they mean what they say. I would say that you know, they probably do not understand the meaning of what they say, because words are historical. In fact, words come to have meaning, which they do not have at a particular point when they are enunciated. So because of that, I think I would probably put it this way. It's very important to understand our idea of that way, to, to argue against its corruption, out against its sort of, uh, yeah, its corruption or uh, you know, destruction in either of these two forms. But I would probably not put it in the French Revolution itself or the imaginary of the French Revolution. I would actually say that these imaginaries themselves evolve and through a kind of dialectic between institutional realization and the ability of the theoretical mind to respond to that kind of thing and to understand its absences and what it requires. These imaginaries evolve. And that's why you know, we have a clearer understanding of this imaginary in that ideal today. So I would, on the one side, applaud the philosophical articulation of the idea, but I would probably be more hesitant about actually seeing it as being present fully in the minds of the French Revolution. The second thing which I found very important in Bangla, and is also very important to my thinking, thinking about the state, I work on the state, is his insistence that uh, 
there's a great significance of the constitutional moment in revolutionary thinking, which I think revolutionary thinking sort of underestimated Francis Rutter. And the section in which he discusses the relationship between violence and stabilization, or violence and law, not just you know, a, a kind of critical analysis of bourgeois legality, but the need for socialist power to establish itself and to produce a kind of legal, predictable, you know, humane form, where the use of power does not remain continually unpredictable, continually contingent in a certain sense. Right? That, I think, is an absolutely central question for socialist political thought. So I thought that was a very, very important point for me. Let me make two uh, slightly <coughs> heterodox uh, suggestions about this in terms of history of ideas. I personally believe, uh, something that I mentioned before, that uh, I think that there, is, there are two reasons why Marxists have been blindsided about the significance of this question. On the one side, I think there is a deficiency in Marx. I think Marx is the most wonderful thinker about the economic logic of, of modernity and the unfolding of capitalism. But I, I genuinely believe that Marx did not understand sufficiently that the logic of modern power is something which is an independent you know, institutional logic of modernity. And it's something which needed to be theorized independently, of course, in connection with capitalism. Because capitalism is not something which allows this to stay still or allows this or uh, sort of allows it to function on its own. So there's a deep connection. But what I feel increasingly is, uh, let me put it more uh, rhetorically this way, it seems to me that there is a kind of, if we think of political theory as an architecture with several floors, I think there is a kind of crucial floor which, give, uh, which is missing in socialist political theory which is the floor where liberalism, for instance, places uh, reflections on things like uh, you know, the kind of things about which uh, the Federalist Papers sort of think about with a great deal of attention, which I think is directly connected to that question of stabilizing power, deciding uh, not just to overturn the power that it is, but then to decide what to do with the power once it comes into your hands. And I think if we look at the history of socialist revolution, Socialist revolutions have been seriously deficient about this, or, and because of this, I think ultimately that power itself becomes a problem because it is untheorized. So that's the second uh, point I want to make. Uh, the third point, <coughs> which is more about today, which again I appreciated greatly in uh, Balibar's essay on equal liberty is the insistence that uh, the great question of equality, again, should be historicized in the sense that the question of equality remains a very important question, but it does not remain in the same shape, because there are different kinds of things which intersect with the question of equality. And uh, socialist political theory has been deficient for a long time historically in taking into account different types of demands for equality, and I think there's also something which is very uh, shrewd in his uh, essay, where he recognizes the difference between the problem of difference and the problem of inequality defined in an older form. And the difficulty that I think serious socialist political theorists must face, but also learn to resolve about how to, how to integrate in a separate thinking about the question of gender, which is very important, and the question of manual and intellectual power which I, I suspect that he doesn't probably uh, put it very strongly in his essay, but I have no doubt that he is pushed into thinking about this, partly because of some absolutely historic change in the, the character of capitalism with the coming of the electronic revolution. But cap the structure of the capitalist economy itself changes, and it raises the question of knowledge and the use of knowledge in the economy fundamentally different, way, which makes the distinction between, or the inequality between uh, manual and intellectual labor, again, a very, very important question. I, however, thought, so the argument that I accept, which is the third argument of great significance to my mind in that essay, is that we need a new theory of equality, which is more many-sided, which is many layered and which also learns to deal with the distinction between difference and equality, difference and inequality. But I was also a bit surprised by the absence in that essay, but in many of your essays later on you have tried to deal with this, 
But I think that you know, this uh, other kind of inequality or, dif or difference, uh, which needs to be sort of written into a kind of revised theory of equality much more, which is the identity differences, which are so important in countries, in European countries particularly, but also in the United States. The insistent demand of identity, you know, which is shape-shifting in the sense that at one point it emerges as a feeling of injustice about race, and at another point it comes out as a feeling of injustice about religious communities. I think that is a question which needs to be stitched to, you know, the other kinds of inequality that we want to bring into a much richer, much more internally complex configuration of the of inequality. So these are things which I really appreciated about <coughs> the essay. And uh, so let me make a final uh, point very quickly again. I don't want to take too much time from you. <coughs> because this is a, in some way, this is a uh, sort of very heterodox uh, position. When I ask myself quite often that why is it that socialists have given so little attention to the study of the democratic state? to the study of the liberal state. Um, it's not that socialists don't give attention to the critical side of this undertaking, but I think if you look at what socialist political theory represents, it's mostly a detailed, sometimes very rigorous and very useful, um, critical exposition or critical engagement with the claims of liberal democracy and bourgeois democracy. But I think there's very little independent attempt to divide the theory of democracy, which is different, from a complaint against stable democracy. I think uh, that's one of the things which bothers me. And I ask myself about, <coughs> about a possible reason why this is so. And this is where I want to make a heterodox solution. I think one of the reasons for that is a reason, which is very, very simple probably, somewhat like the kind of thing that Quentin Skinner discusses in his work of intellectual history. That I think uh, capitalist political power or political configurations associated with capitalism went essentially through two big stages, two very, very large stages. One is the form of the <coughs> form of the state, which Marx called bourgeois democracy, which existed from the time of Locke to the time of, let's say, Mill, Tocqueville, etc. But that's also the time when the shape of a recognizably new form of the state had started beginning. And I think, but it does not emerge and does not establish itself in Europe until the 1920s, late 1920s, 30s. And I think because Marxists sometimes thought that there is already an existing theory of bourgeois democracy in Marx, which there was, if you meant by bourgeois democracy in the earlier uh, structure of regime, they neglected the task of developing a theory of the new regime, which is not bourgeois in the same sense, which is not democratic in the same sense, which is a very different, very new kind of uh, structure of political relationships and the exercise of state power. So I think that is something you know, which still remains a big problem. And uh, Manipal's essay points to this lack, which is a very big absence, in the middle of the dense theory of political economy that Marxism and the Marxist tradition is. So it's because of that I welcome that essay. I would welcome a much uh, you know, longer and much more intensive discussion about all the issues that the essay sort of takes up and the challenges it faces before us, puts before us, and shows that we face that. And I think the great thing about that essay is that it puts before us uh, in a short compass um, a very large you know, task of reigniting serious thinking about socialist political thought. Because if socialist political thought has to break away from the contentment of, or break away from, the, uh, from our sort of uh, self-understanding that the task of socialist theory is essentially to write critical footnotes to liberal theory, then I think we have to take up some of this big issue, uh, sort of rethinking about the idea itself, uh, rethinking about the question of the state, particularly if you are successful in grabbing power, what do you do with it? And how do you actually produce a form of the state which is not unpredictable, which is not, uh, which doesn't degenerate into, uh, you know, uh, personal forms of power or uh, status power of various kinds? So I think 
you know, this is the big agenda for the recovery of socialist politics. Thank you. And I'm going to do this <clears throat> by um, addressing <clears throat> two related things, in fact, the first two uh, essays in, in the book, uh, which is the essay on equal liberty, but also um, the essay on possessive individualism and luck, and bring the themes of the two together. Um, What I, I think what, <clears throat> this is my way of putting it, but I think what Etienne is trying to do in uh, the first essay, in Equal Liberty, is to make what Thomas Kuhn would call a paradigm shift. <clears throat> and this is what I have in mind. In the political enlightenment, in liberal theory, the notion of liberty, the ideals of liberty and equality, as soon as they were articulated, they were immediately theorized in theoretical and methodological developments that put them at odds with one another, and, and put them in tension with one another. <clears throat> and immediately, there was really no scope for understanding them, except as being in tension with one another. And this is a remarkable thing, that in a part of the world, two ideas were uh, articulated and immediately seemed to be difficult to implement jointly. And this went on for two, two and a half centuries until, until now. <coughs> and what, what Etienne is trying to do is to allow for a change in meanings of this term by creating this portmanteau word, equanimity, and theorizing it. He's trying to, to change it in such a way that, change the meanings of the terms in such a way, I would say in the way that, that Thomas Kuhn said that modern physics changes the meaning of mass from how it existed in Newtonian mechanics. <clears throat> and then you could not see it. And if you were to create a different paradigm within which to understand these terms, then they would not, there, there's a chance that they would not be at odds with one another. So the question arises, what constitutes the, the possibility of, what, what makes for the possibility of this shift of meaning? Now, Etienne's way to do this <coughs> has been to study it in the context of human rights to situate it in the context of human rights. And when I grappled with that idea in Etienne's work, I could not make it in my view, I mean, I would like to hear from him more one day, how he would relate it to the difficulties that were raised by Marx in the Jewish question. I still don't know how to do it. Having read Etienne and looked at the issue of rights, I cannot to, to this day, despite really trying to reconcile it, I mean, uh, see it as surpassing the difficulties that were raised by Marx in the Jewish question. So I abandoned Etienne's path to make the paradigm shift. And part of the reason is this. You see, it is part of the liberal notion of rights that you cannot think of something as a right unless the state can implement it. It's just built into the liberal concept of rights. That something is so, <clears throat> the right to work is not a liberal notion of rights because a state cannot guarantee the implementation of work. And in a capitalist society, it actually guarantees that you cannot make everybody work. Uh, so, so there is a, a, one of the difficulties with the notion of rights is that at least in its liberal formulation, it's built into it that uh, rights must be implemented by the state. And so the notion of human rights in the, in the large and generous sense that, that Etienne is struggling to elaborate in, in this, in really ever since he departed from Althusser, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is a notion of rights that, uh, that, that I think it, that there is a, a 
that notion of rights, at least from the political enlightenment's point of view, is a purely mobilizational notion. It can't be a notion of rights which is implementable. It's, it's a mobilizational idea. It's an idea of resistance, but it's not the standard notion of rights. So, so I've turned away from this, and I'm, but I've got the same methodological aspiration, which is to change the meanings in such a way that one could get rid of the tension between them. But that would really mean that the terms would not mean anything, the same thing at all. Just, just exactly like the term mass in, in uh, different paradigms. So, uh, so my uh, aspiration has been to, uh, to depart from Althusser along the, another set of lines, which is to go to the early Marx, the despised Marx, and uh, the despised. Well, and anyway, the, the, in a standard reading of Althusser, that's the Marx that was blasted out. So, <clears throat> so my idea has been, in some of my recent work, has been to try and appeal to resources that were resources prior to the transformation of human beings into citizens. <coughs> it's not appealing to the notion of rights, because I want to appeal to resources prior to that transformation. And relatedly, and this is why I'm interested in his work on lock and possessive individuals, and relatedly, the prior to the transformation of the notion of nature into the notion of natural resources, which is what comes with the Latin social contract. So, and possessive religious and the like. So, <clears throat> I want to appeal to resources to make the paradigm shift so that liberty and equality might have a chance through the changes of being, by appealing to resources that are prior to citizenship as a notion and pr prior to the notion of nature. To, to, to an appeal to the notion of nature, which has not become a notion of natural resource. Now, here, here's an, an initial thought of mine, and that is to appeal to the early Marxist notion of an unalienated life, and make that the central goal of politics, not liberty and equality. Move them out of center stage and make the concept of or ideal of an unalienated life the central goal of politics, and see liberty and equality as merely necessary conditions for this other notion which has replaced liberty and equality in center stage. And that is, I think, to appeal to early Marx and to appeal to the difficulties he raised by the Jewish question for the notion of rights. Now, um, there's a problem here in that the notion of an unalienated life is, a, is an ideal that was widely said by, for instance, Marx himself, but also Rousseau, was widely said to be a notion that was always implemented, existed, prior to modernity. That is, alienation, at least by these writers, is seen basically as a phenomenon of modernity. Because it was claimed that, it was, it's widely assumed that the sense of belonging, however defective pre-modern societies were, the, the sense in which they, they um, uh, were defective did not include alienation. Because of a sense of belonging, however uh, uh, badly uh, the uh, people suffered from liberty and equality. Lack of liberty and equality, they weren't alienated in, in that sense. So, but, but so I'm seeking a notion of an unalienated life in which liberty and equality are necessary conditions for it. So the project that I have, the Balibarian project that I have, which is not Balibar, except in the sense of achieving this paradigm shift, which is, which is not following him in his path, is uh, it's, it's sort of hellishly ambitious, ambitious one because as I've said, I want to transform the meanings of liberty and equality and see them merely as necessary conditions for the unalienated life, but it seems now that I also want to transform the notion of an unalienated life because it can't be the pre-modern one anymore because in pre-modern times, unalienated life was accompanied by the lack of liberty and 
So I want a triangular transformation of all three concepts all at once. That's the paradigm shift. It's, it's all three concepts. It's a sort of bootstrapping uh, uh, aspiration here. So in, to try and do this, I've looked at the, I think we ought to look at, <clears throat> the conditions under which initially liberty and equality were placed in tension with one another. And the two chief sources, I mean there are lots of sources, but let's just focus on two chief sources. One of them is, quite simply, that liberty, I mean this is so well known that I'm just going to say it in a sentence and abandon it. Uh, well, not abandon it, but, but not say much more about it. <clears throat> and that is that the notion of liberty came to be attached, that, that, the, that the position of private property bestowed upon a, a, a notion of liberty. <clears throat> and such a notion of liberty, issuing from such a, a, a phenomenon, naturally led to inequalities. And that is so well known that I don't have to say anything more about it. And Marx was, of course, its most famous critic. But the other uh, source of the tension between liberty and equality, I think, is very much less theorized and ought to be understood much better, especially since the uh, alienated life is something that I want to stress. And that is the source which uh, comes from what I would call, and I have called, the incentivization of talent. That is to say, it is, it, it is very much part of how we think <coughs> that talent must be able to reap the rewards that individuals who possess it have. This is very deep in our psychology. <clears throat> that is to say, in many social worlds, prior to mo modern liberal political enlightenment, in many social worlds, <coughs> the excellences of productions, who was praised for it? The zeitgeist. The zeitgeist was praised for the excellences of particular productions. It was a relatively late development that the excellences of production were, were attributed to individuals because it was considered a deprivation of individual rights to, to see excellence as issuing from the whole zeitgeist. It was, you know, to, it was to see individuals as merely embodied manifestations of the zeitgeist. And that was to deprive one of individual liberty. And, indivi and that transformation is absolutely essential to modern, the notion of desert and the notion of rights that come with it is absolutely essential to modern understanding of liberty. And we know perfectly well how it leads to So here we have two sources for creating the tension, and they just go extremely deep. You would, you would really be considered a hysterical, egalitarian ideologue if you were to question both these things. That's especially the second, because it's goes so deep in our, in our psychologies and, uh, uh, and cultures. OK, so let me just focus a little, a little bit on, on luck and uh, the idea of a social contract to talk about uh, property first. And some of this is perfectly well known, but, but what Locke was really doing was consolidating philosophically a, a process that was called the enclosures movement. It's a historical process, called the enclosures movement, which is to take away the, the collective cultivation of the commons and privatize them. And Locke did it by saying that if uh, the idea of a social contract, as you all know, is the idea of people coming together and agreeing to live by certain principles. And as soon as you make the agreement, <coughs> human beings become citizens. <coughs> and uh, the state of nature in which they make this agreement becomes a polity. Right? Those are the things that are created by a social contract. Or transformed. Human beings are transformed to citizens, and uh, the state of nature is transformed into a part. And Locke's idea was that you can only do this transformations if 
people are better off in, in the adoption of the principles you've made a compact into than they were in the state of nature. Right? That's an essential element. Two essential elements. One, that it should not be a coerced agreement. The compact should not be a coerced agreement, it should be a freely chosen one. And once you've chosen it, you're better off than you were in the state of nature. Now, what, what one notices is that there were lots of people who were protesting the enclosures movement all over Europe, and all over, all over, especially in England, which, which I've studied to some extent. There was a tremendous amount of dissent against the enclosures, you know, the levelers, diggers, and, uh, and they were predated not. But, but what I want to do is to, is to put an argument in their mouths, as it were, to, to show that Locke's arguments for a social contract and how you're better off than you were in the state of nature need not be true. Because Locke's argument was simply this. If people come across, if somebody comes across a stretch of land and he, and he fences it, and he registers it in some office that they've set up, then the land becomes his, right? And, and then the idea is that they, they can hire people to work for wages for them, so long as if they are hired to work for wages, they are better off than they were in the state of nature. Right? So you have a privatized economy of the kind you're perfectly familiar with. You've gone beyond land to industry now, but that's the basic idea. The idea is that if you're better off than you were in the state of nature, then wage labor is a justified policy to live by. Now, what the dissenting voices are bound to say I claim, is the following. It's what economists call an opportunity cost. Yes, they're better off than they were in the state of nature, but they are not better off than they would have been if the land had not been privatized in the first place. Right? So they're going to say there's a, a missing step in Locke. Locke says, right, they're better off than they were in the state of nature, but there's no reason to, to there's no grounds to say that they're better off than they would have been if the land had not been privatized in the first place. Okay? Now, if Locke says no, I think my notion of consent is more correct, historically, and I don't have your notion of consent. You see, the alternative notion of consent is not Locke's notion of consent. The idea is the consent is you have not consented to something because you consent is what you would have chosen and the conditions that never obtained. Right, which is the which were never allowed to be to, to be retained, which is the collective cultivation of the commons. Right. So, so if Locke says I don't accept that notion of consent, then the answer has to be that if somebody has consented in Locke's sense, it's only because it was a coerced consent, right? Because the non-possession of the land is a coercive condition under which to have consented. So Locke's two. Requirements cannot be jointly implemented. You can't, A, be better off than you were in the state of nature, but if you insist you are better off than you were in the state of nature and his notion of consent is correct, then the consent was not freely chosen. So the two requirements, that you're better off and that it be freely chosen, can't be jointly implemented. So the social contract is based, really based, on basically on an inner contradiction. But here's the crucial thing. The idea of a social contract and this entire way of thinking that at the end studies in, in his study of individualism is really got a, con a, a consolidation in later times by an argument <coughs> which is it's, which is this entire source of liberal thinking. And that is the idea. It's basically the individual idea there about which Ethel has written a lot, but it comes through in a very specific formulation, and that is the formulation of what is really very essential to understanding Locke, which is the tragedy of the commons. Right? Because the basis of liberal thought, which justifies, which, which as it were consolidates capital, is that the cooperation that is needed to have a collective cultivation of the commons, which is what the diggers and developers and the dissenters wanted, 
The cooperation that is needed is irrational. That's the idea behind the justifications of privatization of land. Because the opposite, i.e. the collective cultivation of the commons, is based on a notion of cooperation that is irrational. And the claim is that, uh, that it's irrational because if anybody, if every individual asks the question, if I pay the cost of cooperating with somebody else, how do I know somebody else is going to do it? I'm never sure that somebody else is going to do it. So if I pay the cost, I will have paid a cost, somebody else uh, do doesn't pay it, he will get away with it, it's called a free rider, he will get away with it and it's rational for me to do the same. Because I never know. So it's never a short. And if you're in the epistemic dark about whether it's, it's a short, it's not rational to cooperate. This is the heart of liberal thinking that underlies the promotion of capital. It's known as a multi-person prisoner's dilemma, but that's just a fancy word for what I've been explaining in, in perfectly accessible terms. Now, if, if that is right, here is where I think that the notion of an unalienated life comes in. What I would like to be able to establish or argue for, and this is the paradigm shift, is to say, if you even so much as ask the question, if I cooperate, what happens if I cooperate and others don't? You're alienated. You're alienated. If that question so much as arises, if you even so much as, as raise the question, look, what if I uh, cooperate and pay the cost of cooperation? Let's say it's a matter of not overfishing or over cultivation, and I pay the cost and, and restrain myself, but somebody else. If, if you're asking questions like that, you're already in an alienated society. That's the notion of being unalienated. That, so one way to understand the notion of being unalienated is that this question should not even so much as arise. And this, I believe, is, if you think of unalienated in this, in this way, it is part of the notion of liberty. The notion of liberty, were it to exist in a society that's unalienated along these lines, could not lead to the tragedy of the commons or the contractions we are thinking. The more details to be thrashed on, but that's the very basic movement. It's, it's really very difficult because you've you've been you've been asking crucial questions for which I certainly have no ready made answers and perhaps no answers at all, um, uh, which I uh, uh, find absolutely. Relevant uh, from uh, four very different uh, angles, um, and so um, well, I don't want to repeat what has been said, but uh, in uh, uh, Bashir's uh, um, uh, intervention, uh, what I, uh, uh, of course, I, I would. I would, I, I'm sure that you used, you, you, you quoted um, the uh, expression comparing conjunctural France and uh, structural France with uh, uh, perhaps not irony but a little bit of distanciation in this. Uh, in any case, when we, uh, um, when we look at the situation in France today, and uh, uh, when Larry was uh, uh, elaborating on the tragedy of uh, Ferguson and similar events taking place in, in the US, I of course couldn't help thinking of what has been taking place uh, just a few days ago uh, uh, in France. I don't know if it's been reported uh, uh, here. That is the um, killing by uh, police forces 
uh, of a young uh, ecologist uh, uh, demonstrating uh, uh, against the uh, uh, construction of uh, um, yeah. a dam, uh, which happens. I mean, everything comes to the fore progressively. I mean, to to have been negotiated, in fact, uh, uh, between. Uh, the same people who on one hand uh, sit uh, uh, on the uh, local uh, uh, um, representative uh, bodies and on the other hand have a, a direct material interest in having that dam uh, uh, built, you know, so it's a, it's a huge scandal. But this, uh, this young man, of course, was uh, uh, killed in, in, in circumstances which are, are not exactly the same as the ones that you describe. But they also revealed something structural about the relationship, the contradictory relationship between law and, and justice. So, of course, that leads, returning to Bashir's uh, um, um, presentation, to, uh, uh, in fact, at least one, one is French, uh, French citizen, to more than distantiating oneself with anything that uh, would uh, somehow uh, suggest that France is even ideally or structurally the country, uh, uh, the mother country of the, of, the, of the human rights. But you said something else which uh, I think dovetailed with the questions uh, asked by uh, Gabriel Roquil uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, so, so concluding on that, I mean, I. I would, I would, I would want to totally estrange, or denationalize, or uh, 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 deterritorialize uh, every uh, 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 representation of a nation of the rights of man, which is not to suppress, of course, the fact that uh, uh, a certain text, which we are still discussing today, with its potentialities and challenges, uh, has been historically. This is a fact. I mean, this is a fact written and enunciated at a certain singular moment, which is also not any singular moment because it's a moment in the chain of the revolutionary uh, uh, um, uh, insurrections uh, called bourgeois by Marx, but that's, uh, I mean, I retranslated that as civic bourgeois uh, using the two meanings of uh, Burger in in, 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 in in German to to, to to show that there's not only class dimension but etc. But what what you said is uh, which which struck me as extremely important, and I think maybe he would want to say something about that, not contradictory with I don't know where Gabriel is and is uh, behind yes uh, uh, in in my bag. Uh, uh, so um, is the fact that. Uh, uh, if something of the challenge, precisely, or the uh, uh, hyperbolic, as I said some, some, sometimes, or insurrectional meaning, which is in fact function, of course, of these uh, 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 statements, is to uh, return today to the place where they have been uh, first enunciated, it can be only, it must be, and it can be only through this uh, 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 detour, which means that they would have been appropriated by the other, and in fact can uh, keep their function only uh, uh, that uh, way. Um, uh, um, okay, I have to be, and uh, not to return. Now, uh, Sudimtak asked very um, uh, uh, important questions. What struck me was the fact that you, um, you, um, well, you, you emphasized uh, something that is certainly a difficulty uh, of my uh, uh, text. Uh, Akin spoke of the, the break with Althusser. Uh, 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 this break with Althusser, to some extent, was, was a break with orthodox Marxism or a form of orthodox Marxism in which Althusser, uh, uh, like it or not, uh, was completely em 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 embedded. Although there was another Althusser, the one that could uh, uh, join forces somehow with Lefort and, uh, and Arendt that uh, Marie Gay was uh, quoting the, the, this morning, that is the Althusser completely fascinated by classical political uh, theory and political philosophy from Machiavelli to uh, Rousseau and, 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 and beyond. 
beyond. So, of course, that was part of a moment, a uh, moment of discussions about totalitarianism, etc. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, when I, uh, I don't say that I let myself be influenced by the uh, zeitgeist or the atmosphere of the moment, but it had become absolutely clear that uh, uh, even if you don't, if you didn't uh, uh, think in terms of the autonomy of the political, you couldn't leave the political aside, you couldn't see the political as a pure reflection of uh, uh, social and, and economic processes. And the solution would not uh, uh, lie in once again, in once again, uh, 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 trying to uh, um, twist uh, Marx's uh, uh, formulas to somehow uh, uh, make him uh, what he was not, I mean, etc. So you had to uh, return to 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 take foot, so to speak, to 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 stand at least for some time uh, 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 in a different place, and then return to the to the to the to to to, to, to the questions of socialism, for 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 for, for example, I mean, etc. And. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Well, to my uh, immense, of course, uh, pleasure, and, and that was a great honor, I, uh, I physically met Amartya Sen a couple of days ago in, uh, in, uh, in, in Boston. But uh, in that, uh, uh, I never claimed that Amartya Sen was a Marxist. I don't even know if he's a socialist. But I, I, it was uh, uh, an absolute purpose that in the essay, I made use of something that had struck me as very important in uh, in uh, in his work, namely in on on equality, uh, namely uh, uh, what I describe as the attempt of criticizing roles, not from from the right as Nozick had done, but from the left as uh, as uh, as uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, he would he would do. That is not by. Uh, um, uh, uh, pushing the so-called lexicographic order uh, in the direction of the absolute privilege of liberty that you described as a foundation of liberal uh, uh, thought, but on the contrary, uh, uh, re-establishing the problematic tension between uh, liberty and equality in, uh, in, in terms which I uh, found was, uh, would be perfectly compatible with my intentions, although coming from a totally different background. So that uh, didn't lead me to really address the issues of socialism and even less political economy from that point of view, but it would be an attempt at uh, uh, bridging, you see, the uh, uh, gap between the two uh, languages, this being said. Right? Um, and finally, uh, um, uh, okay, I mean, first of all, what Larry said, um, that's, um, uh, that's the best I can hope. I mean, uh, 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 um, sort of uh, syntony or uh, or uh, or resonance uh, resonance between the kind of situations that I uh, discuss in the second uh, part of my uh, books, uh, the uprisings in the French banlieue, or uh, the question of the of the Islamic veil, or uh, uh, etc and the situation in this uh, country. Sometimes I have the Im impression that the situation here is much more tragic than it is in France, but now the situation in France is taking a, a, a turn, I would say, that is so worrying, that, uh, etc. So we absolutely need these comparisons, and we need them not only in conceptual uh, terms, but in, uh, uh, I mean, thinking and, and, and speaking as, citizens, I mean, etc. Now, Akil, of course, that's something I would have to think about very uh, 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 at length. Let me pick up only two, 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 two things. I, mean, uh, um, um, I, I agree with the idea of the paradigm change. But in fact, you are trying the paradigm change much more than I was trying myself. Uh, in a sense, and, uh, and that's also something that uh, um, um, features and and, uh, and surfaces in the uh, other collection of essays that I uh, have uh, um, uh, published, where I speak a little bit more about the Jewish question. So you in, uh, in the in the final, sujet, etc. 
So I am um, I'm, I'm taking the risk of saying that uh, 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 Marx's revolutionary discourse, and in a sense the socialist discourse uh, of uh, uh, the uh, Marxian tradition, etc., uh, is not really breaking with the civic bourgeois insurrectional uh, uh, language. I mean, uh, I'm not rallying to the idea uh, proposed by Furet that uh, uh, the, the the, the, the 1970 revolution is just a, a, a reenactment of the French Revolution, etc. Because in his presentation, this amounts to saying that the catastrophe had already began in 1789. And if we had been spared 1789, we wouldn't have had a totalitarian uh, uh, regime. So, whereas I am desperately trying to explain that uh, a certain insurrection or uh, uh, language and uh, and uh, and, 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 and project uh, that uh, um, uh, um, was there in the uh, English Revolution, that was there in the French Revolution, that was there in certain aspects of the American independence, that was very much there in the South American, Latin American uh, uh, insurrectional movement, uh, and so on and so on, did continue in, uh, in, 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 in the Soviet Revolution with, with all the in, in, in inherent contradictions. Uh, so which, in a sense, is a way to uh, uh, returning to another aspect of the young Marx, of the young Marx, which is uh, 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 the young Marx conviction that inside the French Revolution, with the equivalent of the levelers, you know, you already had communists, you already had equalitarians, you already had uh, uh, Babouvistes, etc., etc., and this is the source of it. So in that sense, I was not so much trying a, a paradigm change then uh, <laughs> almost uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, reverse. But you're absolutely right that uh, after this so-called has been uh, crossed, so to speak, the question of the paradigm change becomes uh, 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 urgent and, uh, and could, can no longer uh, uh, be uh, escaped. And, and that's what you are uh, doing with your uh, new uh, renewed interrogation on um, the uh, question of inalienated uh, life, not as a thing of the past, but as a thing of the uh, present, and therefore somehow uh, uh, converging with the uh, uh, interrogations about uh, uh, um, uh, the new, uh, I mean, both the, the new, f the, the tragedy of the commons and the new forms under which uh, the uh, 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 assumption that connects the Lockean assumption that connects rationality with with with, with appropriation or private appropriation must be radically uh, uh, questioned, uh, and of course that entails returning to the whole story as you do beautifully. But it's essentially uh, an interrogation for uh, today, which not only I welcome, but uh, which I want to. Follow on your on your on your tracks. Uh, you, uh, do you believe that there was a time uh, where uh, a unalienated life? Do I believe it's it's just evidence? Uh, you spoke of and uh, also when you uh, just this. was there a time? Uh, of an unalienated life. Right. Uh, you know, the, the term unalienated in, in an earlier time just meant that people had a sense of belonging. But I think even Marx, most of the time, and Rousseau and all that, do, do say that however bad feudal societies were at the time, alienation was not one of them. Richardson. Well, I'm thinking of all kinds of uh, other. Uh, it's been there a, a, a uh, 
theory of the two parts that now are. Well, I dare say that there may have been antecedents of some notion of alienation. Uh, but, okay, I have a second reservation. Uh, you said, uh, you asked the question, shouldn't talent uh, receive its reward? Uh, is that what you said? Yeah, because but, I yeah. have a problem with that. <laughs> you, have, you have a problem with not rewarding talent. I think it's a very uncharitable uh, way of proceeding. If you, respect, if you reward only people who have a lot of talent, yes. what do you do with those who have no talent? They were born without talent. But, but so we are agreed. I'm not understanding the tone of disagreement. We are actually agreed. Oh, we do? <laughs> <laughs> Um, because it would be, uh, I mean, it, no, it's not that everybody can have a lot of talent. Yeah. Well, but you know, it's, 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 if, yeah. we, if you cut the bonuses. But to which the point the here, if you know me, which is that talent is proved by the fact that bonuses are... Bonuses are justified by the fact that they are true. Absolutely, that's a brilliant point. You know, because we felt like saying that you, yeah, you, you feel like saying if, if the talent got us into the crisis, let's have some mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remind you that talent actually is money. Yeah. Okay, exactly. Yeah. This is to, to Akhil. I wonder if, in addition to changing the meaning of some of the terms, you're not going to have to change the sense of the pronouns. Mm -hmm. Because, at least if you take any kind of Benjaministian line into it, even the proposition that I have a first person is already mm -hmm. an act of taking possession that's differential against another who doesn't have the possession of the language or the possession of the in the field of discourse. Uh, and so, when I'm, since I think it's rather unlikely that we can change the pronoun structure, um, what I wonder is whether the utopian element in your, in your conception is, is sustainable. There's nothing utopian in what I said. I think it is. Mine is not intended as, any, as being a utopian at all. Okay, then take a different word for utopia. And tell me how you <laughs> bypass the, 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 the but, but I'm curious to know about your view. So your thought is that there's something about the first person pronoun which is implicated in these notions of liberty that leads to tensions with equality? I think I'd flip it and say that <clears throat> the notions of liberty as possession derive from the, the, the pro problem of the pronoun. You know, Jacques, this, uh, gee, that is, that is changing the paradigm. You see, I'm not sure that, well, here's what I think, and you tell me how it fits with your linguistic point. Um, I think what we need is really a phenomenology of the kind that Medler Bonte had about brought into the social <coughs> in order to get a notion of this shift uh, about the notion of liberty. Here, here's my, my thought. You see, according to Medler Bonte, he had this notion of affordances. Now, what I think we need is a social version of some notion of affordances because. As one of you said, the world makes normative demands on us, value demands, of how to, you know, for our agency to respond. And, and the point is, to see those demands correctly, you have to see the demands from a point of view larger than your own. It's literally a phenomenological point. If you're going to get a notion of self-governance, which is responsive to the world's demands on you, right? It's got to see the demands in a larger, in a, in a way that is not just oriented from your own point of view, 
Let me give you an example. I'm sorry, if I, I, let me give you a quick example. I was teaching my daughter at the end of trial. And I was, I was uh, uh, you know, I noticed that when I spoke to her, she was sitting next to me, and I was, my bodily orientation to, to her was, was my body towards her. And then I would turn around to demonstrate, and I would drive the car, and I noticed that my bodily orientation was not from my individual body point of view, but from the point of view of the car. <laughs> right? I mean, if I were to, if, if, when, you, when you drive on the road, you don't see the, the thing, you, your, your orientation to the world is from a phenomenological point of view that's larger than your own individual body. You see it from a larger perspective, orientation, which is from the point of view of the car. And, and, and so I noticed that as, I, as when I looked at her, I was seeing the world in one way, and then when I was looking at the road, I was seeing it from a larger point of view. And we need a social version of that. What, well, in my example, it's a physically larger. I'm not going to point to stick to the physical, but I really think we need a social version of that. And if liberty emerges with a point of view that is larger than one's own, seeing the demands of exercising one's liberty in a you know, phenomenality that's larger than one's own, the deliverances of liberty could not be at odds with the, with the demands of equality. That's the idea. Now, I don't see how that that requires you to give up the individual first person point of view. I, you see, because I really, I don't want to get rid of the individual. I think the individual is uh, the person who feels alienation and who exercises liberty, etc. It's just that you need uh, uh, <laughs> Look, I do believe that this grammatical point is extremely uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, you speak of phenomenology, but I'd gladly uh, bring in uh, Wittgenstein in uh, spirit in this. <laughs> in this discussion to support what uh, Jacques was asking. And uh, I put it the following way. While I was writing this, and whenever I returned to it, uh, I was uh, embarrassed, I have to say, uh, by a very simple linguistic uh, fact, which is also, in fact, control and, and historical and even political, um, which is the fact that in uh, uh, our modern languages, uh, it makes sense to say, or I don't know if it's a fiction, of course it's a fiction, but it makes sense to say, I am free. But it doesn't make sense to say, I am equal. Uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it made sense in ancient Greece. You could say, uh, it, had, it meant something to be a homoios because that uh, meant that you belong to the class of the people who are uh, uh, equals and so on and so on. But today it doesn't make sense. Uh, so there's a dissymmetry here with which I had to somehow to deal with and, and that seemed to play immediately into the hands of the traditional vision that links the, the uh, exigency or demand of liberty to an individual or individualist uh, standpoint. And on the other hand, which is also perilous in some sense, uh, uh, links uh, uh, demands of equality to a social collective, not to say collectivist and socialist uh, 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 point of view. Yeah. Now, um, uh, this was one of the reasons why, of course, I tried this uh, logical uh, 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 trick. I mean, uh, not trick, but this logical uh, uh, um, uh, argument, uh, which I would very much much like have to have uh, discussed by good analytical philosophers, namely uh, uh, the, the reference to the uh, uh, idea of the double uh, uh, negation, the, the, the ancient elencos, I mean, the idea that what connects uh, liberty and equality is not the fact that if you uh, analyze the meaning of liberty and, and that of equality, you'll find eventually miraculously that they mean the same, etc. It's, it's, it's in a sense just the opposite, which also has to do with insurrections in the sense in which I took them as, a, as, as examples. That is, it's not possible, in fact, uh, that you claim or that you defend 
liberty if you are against equality. And it's also not the case that you defend equality in spite of uh, uh, experiences that you know. So it was a sort of negative argument that... Uh, but then that led me to the final idea which I uh, uh, proposed here again and which uh, uh, gives me the occasion of uh, returning to uh, uh, what you said at the beginning when you said, and I, I couldn't uh, protest enough at that moment, uh, uh, rights uh, uh, only always uh, are granted by the, uh, the state. Uh, so uh, I, there's a long discussion now running in France and Germany uh, around that. My colleague and friend Catherine Colliotel wrote an important book on that. I hope it's translated. Anyway, what I uh, tried, and that was a sort of guiding thread that I kept when moving to Marx and to the socialist revolution, was the idea that rights are, uh, uh, do not make sense if they are not individualized. I mean, the bearers of rights are always individuals. So even if these are social rights, even if these are cultural rights, ultimately, uh, uh, to call them rights means that you select the individual as the bearer. Uh, but the political process in which uh, rights are claimed, vindicated, and imposed and finally granted to a great, greater or lesser extent is never an individual uh, 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 process. So rights are attributed to individuals, but they are conquered by uh, uh, masses, uh, classes, <laughs> ideas or, or parties, if you want to call, to call them. And so that brings back the uh, uh, Trans individual reciprocity of the of the of the of the I and and the we or or, or, or the of the of the of the collective, but that doesn't solve entirely the grammatical uh, uh, issue which is at, at stake in all, in, in, in all that. This has been an incredibly rich session, for which my thanks. I'm just going to make a brief comment about each of the speakers' remarks. Uh, starting with Larry, I wanted to point out that aside from justice, there's a whole other dimension that is rarely mentioned in the Ferguson instance, and that's the military-industrial complex. People notice the incredible militarization of the kinds of weapons used, and what tends to be forgotten in this narrative is that in fact the DOD makes such weaponry, military weaponry, available on condition that it is used. And that if you don't use it, you don't get to renew the, the gift, as it were. And so this kind of perpetration with all the implications of the military is extremely interesting. But I want to go back to a pronoun that seems to be missing, beginning with last year's comment, and that's she. Because the initial declaration of the rights of man, um, which I wouldn't disagree, opens possibilities, closed possibilities for half the population in the metropole and of course all the brown and black people in the colonies. So, uh, so the need to then open that process, Alain de Rouge, you know, that was always sidelined as a little anecdote of history, but it's an incredibly important appropriative gesture, which of course does not get realized until at least as far as citizen, until 44. 1944, and why? Because de Gaulle thought that women would would uh, would be associated with the right, correct? Um, and in fact, the idea of women's rights as human rights does not emerge until 1995 uh, in Beijing. So it seems to me that any statement about what this declaration opens has to also be preceded by what it closed, always and already. Uh, certainly for, for women. And, it, and to, to, to default to, well, that was the universal man and that was a particular man, is belied by the fact that, of course, the rights of citizenship were denied to, to women. Um, I wanted to also come to uh, the other um, uh, statement here about uh, this notion of um, uh, equality and liberty, because it seems to me one of the problems that in particular the women's movement has had uh, is this notion of, of, of uh, aligning difference in equality. And uh, it seems to me that that paradox 
uh, which in fact was invoked yesterday in Joan Scott's uh, book, uh, is really a bizarre one because if you think about it, any theory of equality necessarily abstracts difference. So equality, in a sense, always has embedded within it a notion of difference. It's just when you know female difference gets uh, uh, argued against equality that the tension is, is if you will, uh, paralyzing. Um, finally, I just wanted to say um, something about uh, this notion of the state as the guarantor of rights. It is, of course, precisely what Hannah Arendt pointed out in the origins of totalitarianism when she uh, pointed out what happened to the stateless uh, in the Second World War. And it seems to me that is in some ways the great uh, fault of the human rights regime, because if you look at the actual declarations, in every case, the caveat is the exigency of the state, which can, if there are whatever um, exigencies the state invokes, then it can disregard uh, the declarations. Uh, so that is a problem that never seems to go away. And I think as a result, we have created this notion of the universal around human rights, which is a historical untruth. Um, at best, it's international human rights, and even there, it could be discussed for it. Thank you. About the, the she, I, I totally agree with you. What I was trying to say is that in the case of declaration, and I was following on the footsteps of, of Avery, as I, as I mentioned, it is as if the meaning is on hold. Once you have declared things, the meaning is on hold and you are not the master and possessor of a meaning because the meaning basically is not there yet. And it will take what Etienne uh, had called this detour to just give meaning to that. And the process of giving meaning is an open-ended process which calls for all the kind of insurrections, the, the insurgents or the divines that uh, 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 Etienne mentions are being, are, will be the one who give meaning to that. The she would say, well, when you say all men, you also meant uh, all, all women. In, in other words, what you are doing is sort of just explode the wording by saying the wording can only have, have a meaning if the wording includes the she. And your man obviously doesn't, doesn't do the, the, the job. But so I this wouldn't disagree with you. The point is the original violence of the gesture of closure in the declaration. Now, okay, you can hold them in, it's, you know, insurrection can follow, but the gesture of that. It is true, but you can return it against it. This is why I was saying that when, 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 uh, to send we have to, we, we mentioned the expression, prompt will kill that letter. Okay, I'm taking your words literally. Did you say that all men are born free and equal and so on and so forth? So here I am, to send we to you, just saying that, that I was born free and uh, I, I need equality and, 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 and liberty. And you, you probably did not have me in mind when you were making your own declaration in your own parliament over there in, in, in the center of Paris. But here I am forcing myself into your words because your words call for me to force myself into them. So and that is the way in which these words, these declarations, acquire their meaning. The idea, you have this very, uh, uh, actually what is Eurocentric is not to say that uh, human rights were born in Europe. What is Eurocentric is to say Europe actually taught human rights to everybody else who returned it against Europe. As if you, had, you were dealing with one single center of agency. Even if Toussaint Louverture asked for his liberty, he has been taught by the French Declaration. So this, is, this would be the ventriloquist who, who does the answers and the responses. That's not true. What is true is to say, well, did you declare that I happen to be someone who has always thought that I was free and that I was equal to any man? And this is totally different from saying that uh, it is a, a, a teaching uh, uh, coming out of Europe. It is a meaning being actually saturated or fulfilled by uh, emancipation everywhere. Cizek mentioned that somehow uh, um, the French Revolution gave the grammar of any kind of emancipation. I mean, that is crazy. 
uh, Algerians did not fight for their independence because they were taught that they were free and equal, but they had the feeling that they were continuing the resistance that happened ever since France set foot on the land. When Emir Abdel Kader started fighting, he lost that fight, which was taken over again, and on November 1st, 1955, it started all over again. And then what the place is taken by the declaration is to say, if you are true to your word, this is the mirror that I give to you. Look at yourself in this mirror. So I was not saying, actually, uh, 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 structural France with, I was saying that with a smile, because it was uh, so Samoyan to say conjunctural France and structural France. But I do believe fundamentally in the structural France as being the universal France. So when I sing with Jean Ferrat, ma France, ma France is not the one of Sarkozy. I believe that ma France is the <laughs> 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 Marx is not a political philosopher. 
Marx is, 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 is one of the uh, uh, greatest possible uh, political philosophers in the uh, history of Western thought, uh, which gives also a meaning, a larger meaning there. So he addresses, he actually addresses uh, 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 fundamental uh, political questions, be they on the side of uh, uh, strategy, tactics, or on the side of uh, 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 institutions and, 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 and social relations. And he does that in the continuity of uh, at least uh, what I presented as the negative uh, and therefore open uh, 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 meaning of the uh, uh, proposition of, uh, of uh, uh, equal liberty. Uh, uh, only, of course, there are some uh, uh, political questions that he doesn't address, uh, I agree with you, and with which he was extremely embarrassed. And, uh, uh, um, uh, for example, constitutional dimensions of the state are, are, are one of them, and that was not without consequences. But this discussion can be carried uh, on only in a comparative manner. Uh, for example, take Marx on one side and Tocqueville on the other side, exact contemporaries reacting to the same kind of uh, uh, um, uh, social and, and political issues, and ask yourselves, uh, yourself, what are the political questions that Marx addresses and Tocqueville does not? And what are the political questions that Tocqueville addresses and Marx does uh, not? So I, I disagree with the idea that Marx was, uh, was not a political thinker. Well, we have noticed that you are not Karl Marx, but uh, allow me to say that you are a great philosophical, uh, uh, political philosopher and thinker and our friend. And it has been our great pleasure to organize this conversation with you and in your, in your uh, presence. When you organize a conference like this, you never know what it is going to look like. So when uh, Shani, Jogo, Mary, Gary, and myself were sitting together discussing it or sending each other emails, etc., we did not expect it to be the great success it has been for these two days because that success depends obviously on all the friends who accepted our invitation to make presentations, to give addresses, and to participate in panels, and it depended very much on, on also Etienne being so generous of his thought and being so acute all the time, etc., and it depended on very much on you uh, attending and making this really successful. So we wanted to thank you very much on behalf of Joe, Marie, myself, and Shani. Wanted to thank you all and thank Etienne Mariba, and let's uh, applaud ourselves. Thank you.